Hey guys, hope you're doing well out there. Today, taking a look at Match Group and Bumble, two stocks in the online dating space we haven't looked at before. Today, we'll jump into the news, some financial highlights, a high-level overview of the companies. Take a look at their technicals from a stock chart perspective before jumping into my fair values for each of these companies. As always, if you're new to the channel and find this type of content valuable, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button below. It would mean a lot. The online dating industry is not a space we have covered on this channel before, certainly an industry I am interested in keeping tabs on. I think there is money to be made in the space over the long term. And while they don't have the most exciting business models, I think there is certain, certainly still growth and money to be made here. We have a long video for you guys here today. If you do stick around and watch the whole video through, that would be much appreciated. Certainly helps out the algorithm. But if you are interested in one stock over the other, feel free to jump around. I'll have the timestamps for each of these companies in the description below. Starting off with Match Group, ticker symbol MTCH, stock trading at just around $39 a share over the past one year is down over 11%. Certainly has underperformed the S&P and even over the last five years is down over 13% and is down substantially from its all-time highs. Back in October of 2021, it hit a peak of over $160 a share. Certainly a massive drop since those all-time highs. It is close to a $10.5 billion market cap. Certainly the biggest name in this space. Now, I do have the earnings for this company pulled up. In the fiscal period ending December 2023, this company is expected to decline on their bottom line by nearly 10%. You take a look at their forward price to earnings though, certainly not expensive, especially for a tech company, for an online dating company, certainly not expensive from a price to earnings. They are experiencing some slowdown in their revenues and earnings over the past few years due to declining subscriber and payer growth really. But over the next five years, you see estimates on Wall Street they are expected to grow in that double digit range and from a price to earnings, certainly not trading expensive at 12 times next year's earnings and just under 11 times December 2025's earnings. And from a price to sales, again, not overly expensive for a software business, for a tech company at just under three times next year's price to sales multiple certainly can be interesting from just a valuation perspective. Now, moving on to the news. So this came out earlier today, Match Group gains on the report of a $1 billion stake from activist investor Elliott Management. They have accumulated roughly a $1 billion stake in the online dating company, and they plan to discuss with Match ideas on fixing the company. Certainly that is a bold statement, but I think anytime you get the eyes of an activist investor, especially looking to fix the company, that can only really be a good sign. This news also coming out for Match Group earlier today. They appointed Faye Yosotaluno, hopefully... I didn't butcher that name as the new CEO of Tinder. And if you didn't know, Tinder is owned by parent company Match Group. And that CEO position will be effective immediately. She has served as Tinder's COO since February of 2022. And she has been a part of Match Group for five years before she moved on to Tinder. And prior to the CEO announcement, the last CEO of Tinder stayed for roughly around a year or pardon me, less than a year after she was appointed as CEO back in August 2022. Certainly, this could be because of activist investors like Elliott Management maybe having a say in who becomes the new CEO of Tinder. Certainly, this is something they might have pushed for. We'll have to just wait and see whether this CEO tenure really proves to be successful over at Match Group. Now, I do have this other story pulled up. After Epic's antitrust win and the Department of Justice search trial, Wells Fargo sees regulatory risk rising for Google. And you might be wondering what I have Google doing here in a segment covering Bumble and Match. We'll get into that in just a second. But Epic Games, which is the owner of popular game Fortnite, won a high-profile antitrust case against Alphabet. This came out back in earlier in December, so just over a month ago. And Wells Fargo sees regulatory risks rising for Google in 2024. And then it was reported that the jury found Google had monopolized the Android app distribution and payments market by charging app developers a high fee of nearly 30% and striking side deals with rivals to fend off competition. And the federal jury also noted that the app store benefits from anti-competitive barriers and they see risks for transactions to move outside of the Play Store or the potential of a concessions on the take rate. So maybe instead of app developers paying 30%, they might be paying 25% or 20%, which could have some impact on Google. They estimate nearly $10.3 billion was generated from the Google Play Store in 2023, which was 
roughly 8% of Google's operating income. So certainly a pr- pretty substantial part of their operating income, certainly a very high margin business over at Google as they just collect these fees from app developers. So certainly could be meaningfully impactful to Google, but how it affects Match Group is that Match Group also had a similar antitrust lawsuit against Google, which it settled, in fact, earlier in October, and it signed a new partnership agreement agreeing to implement the company's user choice billing program, which essentially means instead of being forced to go through the Google Play Store in order to pay for maybe in-app purchases or even to buy the app, they can offer a separate billing choice to the user and the user would have the choice to choose between going through Google or going through a third party payment solution. And in return for that, Match Group got a four points reduction in the Play Store fees and that will go into effect March 31st of this year. So maybe instead of 30%, Match Group now only paying a developer fee of 26%. And the analyst sees Match Group and Bumble as the most meaningful potential beneficiaries of the App Store fee reductions in their coverage universe. Certainly you'll have apps like Snapchat, Pinterest, even companies like Meta that largely pay a pretty substantial amount of App Store fees. They'll all benefit, but certainly so will Match Group and Bumble. And they estimate Match paid roughly $680 million in App Store fees in 2023, and Bumble paid nearly $265 million in App Store fees in 2023. And certainly for these companies, that reduction in App Store fees can prove to be meaningful. Wells Fargo sees a nearly 10% bump up to EBITDA for Match Group and nearly a 20% bump up to EBITDA for Bumble if these App Store fees do get decreased by for every five points. So that is certainly substantial for their bottom line. And possibly in these earnings estimates on Wall Street, that is something they are considering in order to help out earnings growth. Certainly a reduction in App Store fees over time will prove to be meaningful. We'll take a look at their cost of revenues when we jump into the financials and then once again compare this. Now from a high level overview, Match Group does own Tinder and Hinge, two of the largest names in the online dating space. Certainly Tinder is the largest by a long shot and the most profitable. And then they also own Hinge, which is growing at a much, much faster clip than Tinder, but again, isn't as close to the size as Tinder is right now. Match Group also has a bunch of evergreen and emerging apps, namely Match.com, which was their first launched app back in 1995. They have Medic, OkCupid, and Plenty of Fish. And then they have these emerging brands as The League, BLK, Chispa, and Archer. These are largely all acquisitions Match has done in the recent past in order to bolster on their portfolio of apps and really each of these cater to their own audience base. And then they have their Match Group Asia, which again has specific apps catering to that geography in Pears, Azar, and Hakuna. And so they really, they have a pretty large portfolio, namely being Tinder and Hinge. These are their two, two growth drivers, make up the majority of their revenues. And really this is the part that we'll focus on but they do have these other brands that can contribute to revenues and earnings down the road in some substantial manner. Now, taking a look at Tinder more specifically, this is an app that they launched back in 2012 as a mobile only app, patented their user interface and swipe feature, which I'm sure we've all heard of. And they began monetization in Q1 2015. So this is actually a pretty interesting fact. They had roughly three years where they weren't monetized and likely going through a substantial cash burn in order to just grow users and gain that trust. And I think that's a pretty underrated part of Tinder or really any successful online dating app that it's just very hard to scale. If someone was to come into this industry and really try to replace Tinder, they would likely have a pretty difficult time considering Tinder had the benefit of a growing market and really word of mouth advertising back then, which maybe a smaller name wouldn't have the benefit of now and considering their name brand yeah, they certainly have an advantage compared to other apps in this space. Tinder total direct revenues over the past five years, you see from 2018, was at just over $800 million. Back in 2022, surpassed nearly $1.8 billion. That is a CAGR of 22% over the last five years from revenues. But the more important story is Tinder payers and revenue per payer. Back from Q3 2020 up to Q3 2022, Tinder's active payers were growing pretty steadily. It's just from Q3 2022 to Q3 2023, they did see a decline in their active payers. However, they did see a pretty substantial rise in the revenue per payer. And so that just sort of shows that they might have tapped out on total users willing to pay, but they are still able to generate higher revenues through those paying users by a substantial amount. And so maybe they're just seeing a higher churn rate through these users due to cost increases 
over at Tinder. Moving on to Hinge, they have continued to show strong revenue growth back from 2019, where they were posting revenues of just over $30 million, all the way to 2022, where they were posting revenues over $280 million, have been able to grow their payers more consistently. Again, these payers are in the thousands, so a number much smaller than what we saw over at Tinder, as they have payers just around 1.3 million versus Tinder's payers at close to 10 million. The other interesting thing with Hinge is they are also continuing to drive more revenue per payer and have a generally higher average revenue per payer compared to Tinder. So you see your average revenue per payer is over $25 versus for Tinder, it's just over $15. So Hinge, certainly the growth is there over at Hinge. They have significant user and monetization growth but it's just at a much smaller scale than Tinder for now. The other interesting thing from an investor perspective is these products, namely Tinder and Hinge, are designed to be deleted. And especially for Hinge, that's their tagline, designed to be deleted. From an investor perspective, this really is sort of a bit backwards where the success of Hinge is really predicated on if the app is deleted, meaning if people found a match on the app. And so in reality, the more successful an app like Hinge is, the less it will actually be used. And that is certainly interesting. With that, you also get the indirect benefit, though, of advertising, again, by word of mouth. When you get that question of how did you meet, you'll likely say Hinge or Tinder, and then that can possibly spark a new user to join the platform. Taking a look at Match Group's Q3 financial highlights, you see all across the board, based on geography, they did see a decline in their payers across Americas, Europe. APAC relatively stayed flat from a user paying perspective, but then total you saw a decline of nearly 800,000 active payers. You did, however, see a bump up in the revenue per payer really across all geographies across APAC. So APAC is interesting where you've kind of tapped out on user on payer user growth and you're unable to increase your revenue per payer. So it's sort of like Match Group has reached that point where they're unable to really increase prices on their active payers over in APAC. Certainly when you take a look at Americas or Europe, they are still able to drive a fair amount of additional revenue per payer, even though their active payers are declining, they are able to generate more and more revenue through each user. And at a certain point, again, you might see a saturation in the revenue per payer, again, in Americas and Europe's, if Match Group is unable to provide more value based on their current applications. Quickly taking a look at cash flows over at Match Group, this company is very profitable. And so from a net earnings, they generate close to $420 million. This is for nine months ended September 30th in 2023. And so for nine months generated over $420 million in net earnings, $620 million in operating cash flows, and then only really use 50 million in CapEx. And so you have free cash flows of roughly $570 million, very strong free cash flow number. And then they use majority of that in the purchase of treasury stock. You see, even in 2022, they purchased quite a ton of their common stock. And so Match Group certainly is buying back shares. That's how they're returning majority of their capital to shareholders in the form of a buyback. In terms of their balance sheet looks okay. They do have a substantial amount of long-term debt. You see close to $3.8 billion worth of long-term debt year over year that hasn't really gone down and they're sitting at just over $700 million in cash and cash equivalent. So from a current perspective, current ratio perspective, looks all healthy as they have a current ratio close to two, but from a long-term debt perspective, that still isn't great for a software company. I think they should look to pay back more debt rather than continuing to buy their stock at such aggressive rates. They are paying nearly $120 million in interest expenses, and they're only generating roughly $650 million in operating income that this is for nine months ended. And so roughly a quarter to one fifth of their operating income goes in interest expenses. Certainly if they can look to shave off this long-term debt on their balance sheet, even by a little bit, that will certainly prove to help their net income over the long term. The other thing I wanted to point out was this cost of revenue. We took a look at this when taking a look at that Google trial. They're spending roughly $750 million in the cost of revenue over nine months. So if you annualize this, you're looking at roughly a billion dollars in cost of revenue over 12 months. We saw that this analyst estimated nearly a $680 million spend in their cost of revenues for just app store fees. And so that represents roughly, you can call it 68 to 70% of their cost of revenues goes straight 
towards iOS and Google App Store fees. Certainly if those take rates come down from 30% to 25% and maybe over the time down lower at 20%, that can actually prove to be quite significant cost savings over at Match Group, even at Bumble, as the cost of revenues and App Store fees makes up the majority of the operating expenses at this company. Taking a look at my fair value for Match Group, they are expected to do $3.14 in EPS for 2024. That would be net income, just over $850 million. I am expecting nearly a 7% growth rate on that bottom line. You see estimates on Wall Street closer to 10% really in that double digits range. I'm taking a slightly lower earnings growth at 7%, applying a 12 times earnings multiple, taking into account a 1% share buyback every year over the next five years, discounting at 12% and then applying a 10% margin of safety. We come to my fair value for match group at just under $29 a share. That would be a nearly 27% decline from the current price of $39 a share. Now, as always, that is based on my estimates of 7% growth rate on that bottom line and then a 12 times earnings multiple. You get closer to a $29 price target. Certainly, if you expect Match Group to maybe grow at 10% and then maybe apply a slightly higher 14 times multiple, your price to earnings, pardon me, your fair value gets closer to $38, which is basically where Match Group is currently trading at just over $39. So if you expect a slightly higher growth rate at 10%, you could justify paying today's price for the stock. Certainly, again, from a price to earnings, not very expensive, especially when you take into account their growth rates expected over the next few years. The question really comes down to whether they can continue to grow pairs over at Tinder, continue to monetize this at a pretty good clip. And then again, over at Hinge, you have continued growth both in users and average revenue per user. I think if they can do that and grow at close to 10%, yeah, paying just around $30, $35 for the stock certainly could be reasonable. From a technical perspective, this one has been locked in pretty much a downtrending channel. And this is why we look at technical patterns. Basically the stock popped on the news of that activist investors up to $42, got rejected immediately and sold back down closer to $39 a share in the short term. It was making this channel of higher highs and higher lows did break out of this more recently. We do have earnings for Match Group coming up on January 30th. And so in just about a few weeks, you have earnings for the stock will likely move this in one way or another pretty significantly, in my opinion. If you are looking to play this from a technical perspective, I think you are near the higher end of this range. In my opinion, I would wait for at least a pullback closer to $35 a share. I think that certainly can be expected. Your first level of support is really sitting at $36 a share, but lower at 35 is where it would come and test the bottom range of this support. And then closer to, I guess, sub $30 is really where it would continue to stay within this downtrending channel. But that's, I think, a place where you can come in here and maybe play a swing trade, setting a pretty tight stop loss and then hoping for your reversal near the top end of this range. If Match Group does break out from this downtrending channel, I really want to see a close above, you can call it $45 a share, to really confirm that this downtrend of lower highs and lower lows is over. We want to see a sustained set of candles above this previous set of highs at just around $45 a share. Certainly a long way from there right now, I think, since you did get rejected at 42, you know that incremental sellers are stepping in at the upper end of this range. And so I expect the stock to trade really in this channel for the next little while. Taking a look now at Bumble Incorporated, this is a company that went public recently in 2021, is comparable in terms of popularity at least to a Tinder and Hinge. From a market cap perspective, just over $2.6 billion in market cap over the past one year, down nearly 30%. And from its all-time highs, over 60, close to $70 a share is down substantially. And so we'll see if maybe 2024 is the year where Bumble gains its footing after a pretty tough couple of years post IPO. For next year, they are expected to have very substantial bottom line earnings growth over 82 and percent. This is a company that is just on the verge of profitability. So for full year 2023, they are expecting to eke out 27 cents in bottom line profitability. They certainly weren't profitable throughout 2023, but did eke out a few quarters of profitability, I think in the back half of this year. And so from a price to earnings on a forward basis, trading at just under 30 times next year's earnings. So certainly not expensive if they are able to continue to move in the right direction, continue to grow profitability at a pretty rapid clip. Actually, from a price to earnings perspective, 
This company is not trading very expensive. And I think part of the reason that is, is because there's a lot of uncertainty around whether they will be able to grow at this clip or not, well, whether they will really even be able to continue to remain profitable. You see there's a wide range in estimates from analysts. You have 19 analysts covering the stock for next year. The low estimate is at 27 cents, which would represent 0% growth year over year. And then the high estimate is at 94 cents, which would represent, I don't know, somewhere over 200% growth year over year. And so you have a wide range. You probably have a certain amount of uncertainty in terms of where this company will come in from a profitability perspective. It would depend on their cost measures, depend on how well they're able to scale their users and revenues. But really from a midpoint perspective, you're expecting nearly 50 cents of bottom line earnings. That would represent 82% growth and just under a 30 times multiple, certainly not very expensive from just a surface level look, even from a price to sales perspective. Again, we took a look at Match Group that is actually trading at over three times 2023 sales and just under three times next year's sales. You have a company in Bumble that is expected to grow at a much faster clip, trading at just under two times next year's sales. Again, for a company that's just on the verge of being profitable, has very strong gross margins at over 70%, I think under two times sales for the stock, certainly from a valuation perspective, does look very intriguing. Similar to Tinder, this company is undergoing a CEO transition. And so back in November, they announced the departure of their founder and CEO, Whitney Wolfherd, and they appointed Lydia Ann Jones, who was the previous CEO over at Slack, which is owned by Salesforce. She will be effective CEO starting January 2nd. So just last week, she started her role as CEO. And so we'll have to wait and see again whether the CEO transition works out to be successful over at Bumble. Similar to Match Group, this company does have a few apps under its umbrella, certainly not as much as Match Group, but you have your flagship Bumble dating app. Then you have Bumble for Friends, which was launched in 2023. That's dedicated as a friendship app rather than a dating app. And then you have Badu, which is, I think, their oldest, second largest app, which was founded in 2006. And then they have smaller apps such as Fruits and Official. And so certainly a fairly decent umbrella, mainly focusing on the Bumble and Bumble BFF flagship apps. Taking a look at paying users and the average revenue per paying user, you see you experienced a nearly 25% growth year over year from Q3 22 over to Q3 2023 in that paying users. These numbers are in thousands. So they ended Q3 with roughly 2.6 million paying users and then had just over two point, we'll call that just around 2.1 million paying users in Q3 of 2022. And so quarter over quarter, they are experiencing pretty solid growth. You see well over roughly 100K in each quarter. And then year over year, again, 25% growth is very strong on that paying user side. Still an app that is fractionally the size of something like Tinder. We saw Tinder has paying users of well over 10 million. And so this is roughly a quarter of the size of Tinder. But again, you saw Hinge, which had paying users of roughly 1.2, we'll call that 1.3 million. And so from that perspective, Bumble is nearly twice the size of Hinge from just a paying user perspective. The other thing is average revenue per paying user. So this metric for Bumble did decline on a quarter over quarter basis and really over the last four to five quarters hasn't really budged. You see they were charging roughly $28 from an average revenue per paying user for a while. Now this could be in effect similar to what we saw over at Tinder. You see revenue per paying user wasn't really growing while their users were growing. You see this yellow line was roughly flat in the time that their payer, paying users was growing. And so that might be what Bumble is currently experiencing where they're seeing very steady user growth, but that's because their average revenue per user isn't budging. As soon as Bumble maybe tries to push in a price increase to increase their ARPU, yeah, they might see a decline in their paying users. And that's always a tricky thing with really any freemium based model where you have free customers and you want them to switch over to a paying customer and then you want to drive more and more profits from your existing paying customers, you often see a churn anytime you try to do a price increase. You just take a look at a Netflix, a Disney Plus, even Amazon Prime to a certain extent. Anything you have to pay more for at a certain point, you'll have a certain number of users leaving that service. And so my main concern with Bumble is eventually when they scale out their users, they'll want to drive more revenue through those users. And will they then experience pretty much what Tinder is going through right now, where they're seeing a decline in their payers, but really continuing to see a steady increase in the revenue 
per active payer. And so that's something we'll have to wait and watch over at Bumble. From a balance sheet perspective, this company looks fairly good sitting on over $430 million worth of cash and cash equivalents. They don't have a ton of long-term debt, just over $600 million of long-term debt, close to a four on their current ratio as they have well in excess current assets than current liabilities from a balance sheet perspective. Not something to be concerned about. The one thing to note, this company is diluting shareholders pretty rapidly. They are a fairly young company. And so you see last year they had shares outstanding at nearly 130 million. Actually not even last year, this is on a ninth month picture. And so on a nine month picture, you have 130 million shares outstanding that went up close to 136 million shares outstanding. So you do have dilution with a stock like this. While you don't have a ton of debt and all that on your balance sheet, you are getting diluted as an investor. From a cash flow perspective, not looking great, but again, keep in mind, this is a company that's just turning the corner over to profitability. And so in the meantime, their cash flows and net earnings will look fairly small. So just $30 million of net earnings over nine months. That's roughly $10 million every quarter. And then you're adding on close to $84 billion worth of stock-based compensation. And so like we saw, that dilution is pretty substantial over at Bumble compared to a match group that is buying back stock at a pretty fast clip. Now, speaking of stock buybacks, Bumble did repurchase common stock at roughly $21 million. And so they are looking to reduce at least the rate of their share dilutions. Moving on to the fair value for Bumble, we see next year they're expected to do 50 cents in bottom line profitability. That would be net income, just around $67 million. For their next five year growth rates, I did take it at 24%. Certainly 82% for next year is very high. But again, if you, I guess, compound this over the next five years, I'm expecting close to 24, 25% from that bottom line growth rates, applying an 18 times priced earnings multiple, and then 4% share dilution. I did go with a decent amount of share dilution just because they are still needing to raise a pretty substantial amount of capital. 12% discount rate, 10% of margin of safety, and we get to my fair value at just under $11, which would represent Again, nearly a 25% decline from the current stock price. I think share dilution for Bumble is very important. If you expect them to maybe just dilute you at 2% every year, your fair value jumps closer to $12 a share. And so again, I think 4% is a pretty fair value to take. And that's the number I took for my share dilution, which brings the fair value close to $10.85. From a sensitive sensitivity grid perspective, again, if you expect Bumble to maybe grow at 26%, and then you apply a slightly higher 20 times earnings multiple, your fair value gets closer to $13.06, which is not far from where the current stock price is. I think in both cases with Match and Bumble. Personally, for me to become interested in these stocks, I would want to see nearly a 20%, at least a 20% drawdown in their current stock price. I think that would give me a pretty good margin of safety in case the growth rates over that at these businesses continue to slow down, and then maybe they don't demand a high of a multiple as they have in the past. Quickly taking a look at the technicals for Bumble, looks pretty similar to Match Group, has been stuck in a channel of lower highs and lower lows, trading close to the top end of this range, again, closer to $10, really sub $11. It would be near the bottom end of this range. It would be closer to my fair value. At this point, certainly I would be interested from a fundamental and technical perspective. If I was to come in here and invest in the stock, I would set a very extremely tight stop loss at just underneath maybe $10. The stock isn't very liquid and certainly could break through this level of support very rapidly. And so really, if you're looking to come in here and pick up the stock at the lower end of this range, you're looking for a reversal near the top where you would likely come in here and sell, take your profits, would make for a pretty good swing trade in my opinion. From a long-term perspective, not really interested in Bumble all that much, especially while it's in this downtrend. In order to really confirm the end of this downtrend, I would want to see it come up over, we'll call it $16, $17 a share, really until it comes up here and closes above $16, $17. Not convinced that this downtrend really is over. And then from a fundamental perspective, I do like Match Group a little bit better. I think their portfolio of brands, just a little bit more stable and more predictable. Yeah, the growth isn't quite there at Match Group, but they do have Hinge, which is still a very rapidly growing app. And then of course you have Tinder, which has monetized extremely well. I think they just need to figure out maybe how to grow those incremental payable accounts. I think this industry is growing and you have a larger number of Gen Zs entering these apps and this platform. And so certainly you can have continued growth over at Match Group while not as strong as Bumble. I think you do have 
a little bit more safety with Match Group. Stock is also quite a bit more liquid compared to a Bumble, which doesn't have too much trading volume. That was my take on Match Group and Bumble. Certainly an interesting industry to look at. I think both these stocks would need to see close to a 20 to 25% drawdown in order to come down to my fair values and from a technical perspective, both trading near the top end of the range. And so I would like to see a pullback before really I would consider even stepping into these stocks. While they're not a buy right now, I think an interesting name to keep an eye out for throughout 2024. Let me know down below what your thoughts are on Match Group and Bumble, whether you're interested in buying or selling these stocks. If you did stick around throughout this video, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.